The Bible is fascinating, and I will say on the outset, there's some things that you need to understand about the Bible, at least know this, uh, that the Bible is uh, a library. It's not a book. It is a library of 66 books. It originally got its name, Tabiblia, which meant the books. There's 66 books uh, that were comprised over a period of over 1,500 years. So think about that, 1,500 years from start to finish that this you know, library of books was being comprised. And with that, over 40 authors contributed to, to Scripture. Now understand this, we believe in what we would call dual authorship. So there is 40, there are 40 authors who contributed to Scripture, but then there is also just one author who ultimately gets the credit. And it is through his inspiration that inst individuals uh, put pen to pad and in some way participated in their act of obedience, contributed to God's written revelation for the world. It, it is amazing. So it's, it's 40 authors, it's 1,500 years. It uh, also was written on three different continents in three different languages. Now, this is amazing because when you take into account all the different people who contributed and the vast uh, distance between these people on different continents and the fact that there was language barriers, yet somehow all these individuals over this you know, vast course of time, which they never met, never got to have a planning meeting, never said, hey, I'm gonna tell this part, you pick it up here and tell this part, and then you tell, th no, they didn't have that. They just responded in faith and wrote what God put on their heart. And somehow, they all told the same story, delivered the same message, elevated the same theme, and pointed to the same person. And who's that person? Jesus Christ. Yeah, one of my favorite quotes of all times is the Bible is the Father's portrait of the Son painted by the Spirit. And so wherever you are in Scripture, just know I believe every book, every chapter, every page, every paragraph, every sentence points to Jesus. And so it's just recognizing that this is a pretty vast work that is rich in history as well as revelation as to who is this God that we serve and adore. And I think it's often uh, the case that people will raise the tension between uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you're new, the Bible breaks up into the two. And I would say this, in the old, the new is contained. And in the new, the old is uh, explained. That makes sense? So in the old, the new is contained. And in the new, the old is explained. And what you find is, uh, throughout centuries on end, God unveils his redemptive work in the world and sets the record straight. This is my plan, this is my desire, and this is my will. And so there's so much that we could learn from scripture, and we, we will get into that. Know this, uh, there is a lot to the Bible uh, that is uh, mysterious. Uh, there is a lot that has us at times scratching our head or even fighting the impulse to argue or disagree with God. Come on, wave at me if you've ever read the Bible and wanted to disagree with God. Come on, where are my real honest saints? Yeah, it, it challenges us, and uh, that's just a real thing. And just know if you ever get in an argument with God and you win, what do we say? You lose, right? And so it's just learning uh, to trust him in the moments that he exceeds our comprehension. In fact, I would say uh, when you don't understand God, remember you stand under God, right? When you don't understand God, remember you stand under him. He's God and you're not. And quite honestly, I'm glad he exceeds our comprehension. I'm glad that I don't have him fully figured out. I'm glad that he has wisdom and capabilities beyond my own because I can't save myself. I need someone better. And you can't save yourself. You need someone better. And so be careful you don't reduce God to a peer who can't serve uh, the true purposes and desires that he wants to accomplish in and through your life. And I, I do think there is that tension. In addition to that, there will be uh, the easy pushback. I've bumped into this probably my whole journey in the faith. I would say that this was one of my favorite arguments. Uh, and then I realized that it just didn't carry the water that I assumed it did. And that is people will look at the Bible and they'll say, well, what about all the contradictions? The Bible is full of contradictions. And I would say what uh, at times seems like an issue of contradiction is actually 
an issue of comprehension. Uh, eventually what you start to discover is uh, God is not confused and God is not changing his mind. And where we uh, get hung up is pretty easy. One, uh, we take a lot of scripture out of context. We don't understand the culture in which things were said and the terminology that was being used. And in addition to that, a lot of times we overlook the, the genre of literature that is being written at the time, whether it's history, poetry, uh, you know, prophecy, there's all kinds of different genres in scripture. Uh, in addition to that, sometimes we have a hard time identifying whether or not a passage is descriptive or prescriptive. And, and so again, I, I would just say for the person who's like, well, there's all these contradictions, um, you should wrestle with that tension. Uh, because I do think you would find that uh, there's actually not all these contradictions and there's something uh, that tethers them together. For example, I always found that uh, the God in the Old Testament seemed always angry. And then Jesus shows up and seems so compassionate. And there was this uh, tension between the Bible's emphasis on justice as well as the Bible's emphasis on mercy. Well, which one is it? Is it justice or is it mercy? And then you stare at the cross long enough and you realize, yes, it's both. That the finished work of the cross is the pinnacle of justice and the pinnacle of mercy taking place simultaneously. It is beautiful and it isn't a contradiction. And in the Bible, there is a book by the name of Hebrews. And I wanna bring you into this entire chapter, chapter four, as we jump into this to kind of show you some things. One, starts out in verse one. And he says, therefore, since the promise of entering, someone say entering, the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also, look at this statement, have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. So now, what he's saying on the outset here is the writer of Hebrews wants us to know that God came offering and extending to us rest, which is a really great idea. In fact, when God charges Moses with the responsibility of implementing the 10 commandments, what was one of the 10? The Sabbath, keep the Sabbath holy, that God cares deeply about soul care and your uh, well-being and understanding that rest is critical. And I think every single one of us can relate to uh, the fatigue that we experience in life. There is relational fatigue, there's mental fatigue, uh, there's emotional fatigue, there is spiritual fatigue. And scripture's saying, yeah, but know this, you don't have to go through life slugging it out with your own faculties exhausting yourself and discovering over and over again the limitations of your humanity. No, there is a rest that is available to us that God promised, and that promise still stands, that you and I can enter this rest. And he makes this clarifying statement. He says, but let all of us be, uh, be intentional to not fall short uh, of you know, this rest or this promise as others have. Essentially what it's saying is there was a generation of people who were told, hey, God has great things in store for you. God desires to do amazing things in and through your life. Yet they didn't trust, they didn't believe, they did not attach faith to the promises of God. And so those things just didn't come to pass in and through their life. And the writers of Hebrews are saying, okay, but that's not gonna be us. We're, we're gonna learn from what we maybe witnessed in shortcomings in other individuals, and we're gonna say, okay, how do we not fall short, and how do we take advantage of this rest that God is offering? Now, it's in this context, he picks up in verse 11, and he says this, let us therefore make every effort to enter, there's that word again, that rest, so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And check out this statement. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. 
Now, when anyone read that and you get a little nervous? that everything is uncovered, everything is laid bare before the one that we all have to give account to. And if that uh, gives you any sense of timidity or fear or concern, uh, well, there's a good chance you, you may be reading it wrong or misinterpreting it. And hopefully we can unpack some of that. But what we find in this passage and what we find all throughout scripture is this overarching claim and theme. Hey, the Bible, God's word is the uh, source of truth, logic and wisdom, and it is God's written, infallible, and inherent inspired word. And when we anchor our lives to it, uh, it is able to accomplish uh, God's perfect and pleasing will in us and through us, and it is amazing. And I would say I, I really struggled with this. I, I thought that the, the Bible was a bunch of nonsense. I grew up in a pastor's home, which I was raised by wonderful parents, uh, and I just had a, a part of my nature that was rebellious and curious, and I, I just drifted. I don't know if you can relate to that. Raised by wonderful parents, but I just made some decisions on my own that were dishonoring to God, which I would just say to all the parents in the room, just take heart. Uh, you know, there are sometimes as parents, we take too much credit for both our kids' success and failures. And, and just know we, we all have to figure this out. I was raised in a wonderful family, and just struggled with this. But there are a couple of things that I encountered and got to witness firsthand in the life of my father uh, during the season that I was struggling the most with my own personal faith and doubts in God. And I grew up in a home where I got to witness and see modeled for me every single day, my father with his Bible praying and reading scripture every single day of my life. I'm so spoiled to have had that model in my home. And there came this point, I'm, uh, in, I'm 19 years old. I come back from my freshman year of college and my dad and I, my brother, decided to take my teammates four-wheeling in the mountains. We grew up in Colorado and there's what was called the book cliffs that were surrounding us. The book cliffs were these big sand dunes and X Games would come out and they would host their annual competition out there. And so I raced dirt bikes and four-wheelers and we take my teammates out there to experience the sand dunes. And we're on these four wheelers and my dad and I, we get to the base of the mountain before my brother and my teammates catch up to us. So we get to the base of the mountain and we take our helmets off and we're sitting there talking, waiting for my brother and my teammates. And suddenly we see them start to make their way down. And my dad's truck is parked about 50 yards away with the trailer and he says, okay, let's go start loading up our four wheelers and we'll get started before they get here. So we go to pull away and my dad turns and freak accident, his wheel just falls into a rut and buckles and he flips over the handlebars of his four-wheeler. And he lands square on a rock. And like I said, we had just taken off our helmets uh, to talk and so he doesn't have his helmet on. He smacks this rock. And if you've ever been around someone with a really traumatic brain injury, my dad hopped up and for about 20 seconds just started speaking gibberish. Just all these noises and things that didn't make any sense. And so I, I get him to sit down and he asked me this question. He says, CJ, what just happened? And I said, well, dad, you, you just flipped over your handlebars and hit your head. You just need to take a seat. Let's do this. I'll put you on my four wheeler. I'll drive you over to the truck. I'll come back and get yours. So we get on the four wheeler, we're, we're driving to the truck and my dad asked once more, maybe 15 seconds later, CJ, what happened? I, I said, dad, you, you flipped over the handlebars, you hit your head, we're going to the truck. We get to the truck, he asked me a third time. It's clear, okay, dad, you're, you're not comprehending what we're discussing. So my, I get my dad in the truck, my brother and my teammates come pulling up, they still have their helmets on. And I'll never forget it, it's as if my dad had never seen an individual with a helmet on before. And they come flying up on their four wheelers and my dad just absolutely panics. Tries jumping into the back of the truck, like he's, he's freaking out, he doesn't know who these individuals are and what they're doing approaching him. So my, I tell my brother, hey, call mom, I'm gonna take dad to the hospital. So I take him to the hospital and what would eventually become a very long month for us, my dad completely lost his memory for four weeks. 
It, it was wild. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. And, you know, sometimes a situation like this, they can't guarantee you'll regain your memory, how much of your memory you'll regain, when you will regain it. And so we had to go through this exhaustive process of photo albums and explaining to him who he was and who everyone in the family was. In fact, I think it's mainly just because I was with them the entire time. I was the only person my dad knew. My dad didn't know who my mom was. He didn't know who my siblings were. In fact, my grandma was in town. He didn't know who my grandma was. And so what was wild about that is my dad would sit there in a room and initially it was in the hospital and you could tell he was confused about everything that was going on. And he would sit there on the chair and he would just quote scripture nonstop. And I remember there was this time the doctor said, man, I, I just don't understand it. This guy doesn't even know who his wife is and his kids, but somehow he will quote everything Moses ever said. <laughs> and I, I just remember this doctor uh, you know, kind of being fascinated by my father. Well, this, this scripture is, I mean, it is wired in him. And somehow this has stayed with him through this accident. And I remember as this uh, proud atheist at the time, looking at my father and just being like, well, that's, how do you explain that? That's different. Back it up a little bit before that, you know, there's a time that my dad, you know, went through multiple back surgeries. In fact, it was because of me and my teammates once more, we were playing in a pool on a road trip for a tournament and my dad grabbed two of my teammates and he went back to dunk them and he just completely ruptured the disc in his back. And so my dad went through three back surgeries. After his second back surgery, um, he was just in extreme pain and he decided, I'm gonna go get a second opinion. So he goes to get a second opinion from a, a surgeon. And like you've experienced, you go to the doctor, they ask some of the you know, preliminary questions. And one of the questions is, is what medicine are you currently taking? My dad says, well, I'm, I'm taking oxycodone, which some of you have heard of, and there's different names for it, uh, a highly addictive drug. And there's even a Netflix documentary out about how many people, when this drug first hit the market, really abused it and got addicted to it and how it was uh, poorly even prescribed at times. And my dad tells the doctor, here's, here's what I'm taking. And the doctor says, no way. There's no way a doctor prescribes that much. That's way too much. And my dad's like, well, I'll even get the bottle for you to show you the label. This is what I've been taking. And the surgeon goes on to tell my father and my mother, hey, this is way too much of this narcotic that you're taking. And you don't realize it, but to be taking this much for as long as you've been taking it, you are addicted to this drug. And so the surgeon tells my dad, we have to admit you to a rehab center. To which my father was like, well, I can't do that. I'm a pastor. If word gets out that I go to a rehab center, <laughs> I'm going to lose my job. And he's like, I'll just beat it on my own. To which the doctor's saying, hey, that's not wise. That's extremely dangerous. So for those of you, please do not take medical advice from me. I'm just telling you the story of my father. And we get my dad and mom come home and my dad decided that he was just gonna lock himself in his bedroom and not come out until he broke it. And so for uh, this period of time, my, my siblings and I literally, we would bring in on a TV tray and we would bring my dad his meals in his bedroom. And my dad sat there on this pink suede chair in the corner of his room, rocking back and forth, sweating profusely, praying and gripping his Bible. And then one day we were sitting in the kitchen and he just came walking out and him and the Lord kicked this addiction's butt. It was awesome. I was like, wow, that's, that's amazing. And so there, there are these two moments in a really you know, critical season of my life where I was having major doubts, where I, I got to witness my dad's relationship with the Lord and just his dependency on scripture and its dependability through it all. And I, I just think it is recognizing that maybe, just maybe there's, there, there's more to this. And, and folks, I would just say that when it comes to the Bible, uh, the Bible can make claims that no one else can or nothing else can. Uh, one, when it comes to ancient manuscripts, folks, there is no other community or religion or philosophy around the world that has comprised 
or collected or compiled more ancient manuscripts than the Bible. In fact, there are over five, I think it's like 5,600 Greek, 9,000 Latin and 10,000 Slavic and Gothic. And there's all of these manuscripts. And what's wild is the impeccable consistency across all these different languages, across this vast period of time in all these different regions. Somehow this word was uh, captured consistently. It really is uh, amazing. In addition to that, you look at uh, just the prophecies in scripture. Like take, for example, the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, Daniel prophesies the rise and fall of three empires, the Babylonians, the Persians, and the Greeks. And all three come to pass. That's pretty bold. And that's nothing compared to all the things that were prophesied about Jesus centuries and centuries before his arrival. Everything from the, how he would be born to where he would be born to the family of which he would come about. I mean, the things were laid out and the fact that Jesus shows up and accomplishes it is outstanding. I also think in addition to that, when you look at the impact and the influence of God's word around the world, and when you look at the science community, medical community, education, civil rights, you look at the rights of women and children and even the abolishment of slavery, all these things around the world, and you cannot ignore the fingerprints of Christianity and the instruction and the clarity that God's word inserted into those things. And it really is pretty impressive that when you start to look at God's word, it does stand in a category or a league of its own. In addition to that, what I love about our faith is we don't just believe in some fairy tale cosmic God in some far off place uh, who doesn't resonate or relate to us. We don't see God as Thor from Asgard, right? We have a God who showed up in real time amongst real people in real history experiencing real events. And all this is documented. In fact, there is more proof. Don't take my word for it, please. Do your own research. There is more proof that Jesus Christ resurrected from the grave than Julius Caesar ever lived. And if I were to stand up here and be like, you know, get you questioning your belief in whether or not Julius Caesar was a real figure, you would push back on me immediately because you receive him as a historical fact. Uh, but just know that the, the burden of proof tips heavy in the direction of Christ and, and Christianity when you start to lean into it. It, it truly is outstanding. There is no other uh, piece of literature that has been more studied and more academically scrutinized than the word of God. The, the fact that God's word still stands is pretty impressive. In fact, I would say it's worth your time because it has stood the test of time. That if God's word was easy to dismiss, folks, it would have been dismissed a long time ago. We're not the first arrogant generation to show up thinking we know better than God with a bunch of wonky ideas that resist and contradict his will. No, God's been dealing with knuckleheads like us from the very beginning. <laughs> Yet his word, it, it stands. And so again, it's just learning to be like, oh my goodness, there's such a depth and a richness to God's word and it has this ability to instruct our lives. And there's this verse that I wanna draw to your attention and you know, he says a lot of things here and check out this new toy that the, the staff got me. Okay, so we'll go here. So first we're, we're talking about the word of God, right? And there's all these different pairings, right? So first you have, he says, it is alive and active. There's a pair. Then in addition to that, you have, it is sharper and it penetrates. Then in addition to that pairing, you have marrow and joints. In addition to that pairing, let's see what else you have. You have soul and spirit. And then lastly, you have attitudes and thoughts. And let's see if I missed any. No, that's it. So, so here's what you have to understand. Sometimes scripture will give you a pair 
of analogies or descriptive words. And a pairing is actually a, a gift <laughs> because a lot of times you stare at an idea and you think, what is God trying to get across? Well, when he lays something beside it, you pay attention to what they have in common, right? What do these two things have in common? And maybe that will elevate my understanding of the point that he's trying to make, right? So he wants us to understand that the word of God is living and it's active, right? It's alive and it's active. So this would talk about the ability of God's word, right? That there is this productive, energetic, just expansive power that is at work in God's truth that somehow it, when it gets into your life and ingrained into your heart and mind, it does bear fruit. God says, my word does not return void. And what you discover is, and maybe you've already encountered this. You wake up in the morning, you read your Bible, you have your little devotions, and then you go off to work or go off to school, or maybe you're at practice, and hours later, doesn't a thought come emerging to your mind? And suddenly it's like, it's been at work in your head, in your subconscious, suddenly you know, producing a revelation in your own heart and experience with Christ. In addition to that, maybe you've experienced it where you have been in church your whole life. You've heard sermons preached on these passages. You've read these passages and you come to a page in scripture and you think to yourself, I've read this scripture probably a hundred times and I never seen what God revealed to me today. You ever, it's like, it's, it's active. There is so much there that you, you get to engage with that this is not some dead text. And what you discover as when you lean into God's word, it does have this way of engaging you and gripping you in a very different way. So you have to understand there is an ability uh, to God's word. In addition to that, I would say there is a method, right? So these two are connected and this is the method. How does God's word go to work in our life? And he says, it is sharper than a double-edged sword penetrating, right? To the, the, the depths of our soul. And when it says the word sword there, it's not what you and I think. You know, it's not Zaro pulling out this big machete. It's not the type of, you know, sword that you would see a soldier heading into battle with. In fact, if you go into the original language, the last time we see this word for sword is in Matthew 26, when one of Jesus's disciples pulls out a knife and cuts a guy's ear off. And who was that guy? Peter. And what was Peter's occupation? Fisherman. He was a fisherman. So essentially what this is referring to is more of like a fisherman's knife. A, a knife that was, you know, made, fastened to precisely cut the flesh of a fish that you were cleaning and preparing. And there is this method in which God's word pierces and even at times cuts our broken flesh. You know, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. We, we all run into resistance. We all bump into challenges in this life and we all you know, discover at different times the brokenness and the wickedness of our world. And this resistance comes to us in three forms. We, we discuss this. It comes to us either by the devil, the world, or the flesh. And God's word, it, it goes to work on our flesh. So there's this inability, there is this method. In addition to that, there is this tie between soul and spirit, which is huge because ultimately that is the target of God's word. God's word is targeting your soul. What makes you you? Here is a really terrible illustration, but it's the only way I can get it maybe across. If, if your child had to have their arm amputated, would they still be your child? Well, duh, that's yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, if they had to have their leg amputated, still your child? Yes. Say they lost their eyes and their ears, still your child? Yes, and you can run this illustration out to where it gets really gross and uncomfortable for all of us, but at the end of the day, you start to realize you can dice it up as much as you want, but there is something within the depths of a person that truly makes that person who they are truly gives that person life. And that's the very essence of our soul that Christ came to redeem and to save. And so what you find is that it is your soul that God's word is primarily targeted at. 
Right? It's a great, great idea. In addition to that, Scripture wants us to know that it goes to work internally. So it's an internal method targeting our soul, right? And then there is this process. So he, he's saying a lot there. I started writing sideways there. But, but he's saying a lot. And what's interesting is, you know, a lot of people will argue about the faith in terms of science. People think science is the enemy of the faith, which is ridiculous. Um, science is no enemy of the faith. It only complements our faith. The reason why Christianity gets pulled into so many science conversations is because uh, Christ, the Bible at times uh, will speak to you know, scientific matters that for whatever reason, uh, they've carried weight over time. And people have looked at it and thought, okay, this is not a book on science, but there are certain things that this shepherd boy said in the field that long before an ultrasound ever came about and long before we understood pregnancy, somehow this kid did. And he knew that he was knit together in his mother's womb and he, he knew all these things. How did he know? And so it gets pulled into medical conversations. It gets pulled into science conversations. But what you discover is there's so much brilliance to this. Like if you look at Morrow and like, well, what, what purpose does Morrow, you know, serve? And it literally produces blood cells that are essential to life. I just think that's great that God's word goes to work on the things that are essential to the true life that we're called to live. And so he's building this out and then he comes to here. And what you're gonna find in the Bible is there is this three-step almost process laid out. And it is your thoughts, your attitude, and your actions. Your thoughts, your attitude, and your actions. That your thoughts produce your attitude, and then your attitude produces your actions. And what's amazing is the writer of Hebrews says that God's word goes to work on our thoughts and our attitudes. And what's amazing is the writer of Hebrews does us a, a service, and he doesn't even list behaviors and actions. Because it's almost as if the writer of Hebrews knows, hey, these people are always going to drift towards performance. They're always going to drift towards trying to earn or produce this on their own. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take the focus off of actions and I'm just going to place the entire focus on thoughts and attitudes. It's, it's as if to say, the moment you allow God to inform your thoughts and shape your attitudes, it will produce God honoring actions and behaviors. Is that, are you tracking with me on that? And so this is a, a pretty loaded verse where you know the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, understand how the word of God works. That the word of God has this ability to work internally through this method that goes to work on our flesh to create this process targeted to redeeming and shaping and fortifying our soul. The word of God is, is huge. And this is the follow-up to this idea of you and I entering rest. Think about where the passage started. It says, hey, that the promise of rest still stands, enter his rest, which is wild to think about. Okay, how do we do that? And then he immediately shifts and says, for the word of God is living and is active, is sharper than a double-edged sword, as if to say, this is one of the key ways the primary ways that you enter his rest. And I think that word enter is critical because again, we are bent towards earning. And you don't earn his rest. This isn't something we produce on our own. It, it is something that by faith, we just enter into. And I think the challenge for every single one of us is going to be the times that we bump into something in God's word that requires us to extend faith. And here's the, the challenge for all of us is the evidence that we are often looking for when it comes to obedience is found on the other side of obedience. That's how faith works, right? The evidence that God is good, that God is faithful, that God's promises are true, that God is going to uphold his end of the deal, that his will is going to come to pass, well, that's on the other side of our obedience. So when you bump into something that has you scratching your head in God's word, well, to understand why, submit and apply. 
right? Like I have to embrace this in faith and that's what was holding the, the previous generation back, what he's talking about. They, they didn't attach faith to this and then they didn't enter into this rest, which is wild to think about. Now watch how he ends the passage. I'll clear this off. Go ahead to the very end of the passage. So he talks about rest, then he talks about God's word, and then he comes and he says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So, so think about this. Chapter four of Hebrews, it starts out with this idea of rest. Standing right in the middle is this truth about God's word being living, active, cutting our flesh, going to work on our soul, instructing and guiding our lives. And then it ends with this idea. So you and I, recognizing who our savior is, we approach God with confidence. So the book ends of this passage, rest and confidence. And in the middle is what do you do with God's word? And it's amazing because people will read this passage and the thing that they will focus on is that statement that sends chills down our back, that everything will be uncovered, that everything will be exposed, that every detail of your life will be laid before laid bare before your creator and the, the God of heaven. And you and I must give account. Well, that's terrifying to some to read. And here's the deal. The word of God is the will of God. And there are two ways to read a will. There's two kinds of people who read a will. You can either read it as a lawyer or you can read it as an heir. And a lot of people, when they, they come to God's word, th they're reading it like a lawyer, which would explain so much of the legalism within churches. Rather than reading it like an heir, I receive what because who did what for me? Yes. And, and so what you understand is in this moment when he says, that, hey, we all lay bare before our creator, it's not a threat. It's saying for those who are in Christ, they look forward to that moment. They long for that day because they recognize I'm in Christ and now God views me the same way he views his one and only perfect son with just an overwhelming sense of love and devotion to me. And so it is in that tension that we understand the importance of God's word, that rest and confidence in our relationship with God is hinging on what do we do with God's instruction and his word in our life. And maybe, just maybe, the challenge for some would be to stop reading God's will as if you're a lawyer. And maybe just start reading it as if you're a child who is an heir to the kingdom, who has been blessed beyond measure because of our good God, amen? amen. Folks, God's word is, it is outstanding. And so I do wanna encourage you, as a church, we wanna continue making this strong shift in just emphasizing life groups, emphasizing a studious approach to the faith and understanding, listen, there's always gonna be things that push against what we believe, but we have a lot to stand firm in. And those who stand on the word of God, they stand in the storms of life. And I just, for me personally, there, there's just not anything in this entire world that has had a greater influence or impact on my life than the Word of God. Uh, it's not to say that it was not super challenging on the front, and there are days that it's still challenging. Uh, you ask any seminary student, they'll just tell you the depths of this, sometimes the floor falls out. But I promise you, I promise you, you owe it to yourself. You're not doing me a favor but you owe it to yourself to open God's word and to say, is there anything here that as an heir, maybe I could take advantage of, amen?